More than a quarter of the world is under economic sanctions, but are they effective and who bears the brunt of these measures? Hello, I'm Arnold Nider and this is The Heat. The United States and Western powers consider sanctions a diplomatic tool. It targets consider sanctions economic blackmail, if not a form of warfare. The idea is to financially suffocate a country and even force a change of government. But sanctions also can deepen poverty and even kill people without achieving their goals. Despite the harm to civilian populations, wealthy nations are imposing sanctions more and more. We start with this report from CGTN's Jim Spellman. Go back 60 years or so, and only a few countries, nations like Cuba and the DPRK, faced sanctions or embargoes from the UN and Western powers. Today, more than a quarter of all countries, producing nearly a third of global GDP, face sanctions. That, according to a new report from the Center for Economic and Policy Research, a U.S.-based think tank. Sanctions have become a common tool for U.S. administrations. New sanctions today. Sanctions. 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 And key U.S. allies. New sanctions. Sanctions today. The report finds that sanctions have had a brutal impact, contributing to poverty, inequality, reduced health care access, even impacting child mortality, and lowering life expectancy in some countries. Despite common humanitarian exceptions to sanctions, the report finds that overwhelmingly it is the most vulnerable who suffer the most under sanctions and not the political, military or business elites the sanctions target. Typically, sanctions aim to pressure governments to change policies seen as harmful to Western security or interests. Research suggests sanctions often have limited success in achieving the desired outcomes. Russia currently faces sanctions over the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. Russia is convinced that there is a real alternative to such a destructive course, a policy of blackmail and illegitimate sanctions. This is the strengthening of stability in the world, the consistent building of a system of unified, indivisible security, the solution of large-scale tasks to ensure economic, technological and social development. China faces U.S. sanctions, including some aimed at China's rising tech companies. China has always opposed unilateral sanctions and long-arm jurisdiction that have no basis in international law and are not authorized by the U.N. Security Council. China has always carried out normal economic and trade cooperation with countries around the world, including Russia, on the basis of equality and mutual benefit. Despite evidence that sanctions are often not effective and can have a devastating impact on the lives of civilians, there's no sign the United States or other Western countries are backing away from using sanctions as a foreign policy tool. Jim Spellman, CGTN, Washington. Now to talk more about sanctions, let's bring in our panelists from Blacksburg in Virginia. Javad Salahe Isfahani is a professor of economics at Virginia Tech and one of the authors of how sanctions work, Iran and the impact of economic warfare. From Managua, Benjamin Norton is an investigative journalist and editor-in-chief of Geopolitical Economy Report. Here in DC, Barbara Slavin is a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center. And Ivan Eland is a senior fellow and director of the Center on Peace and Liberty at the Independent Institute. Welcome to all of you. Jarba, let me start with you. You are one of the authors of this book, How Sanctions Work, Iran and the Impact of Economic Warfare. What is your main finding on the in effectiveness of sanctions or otherwise? Well, as your uh, report indicated, uh, sanctions hurt the most vulnerable groups in society but rarely uh, affect uh, the leadership that results in a kind of way that results in policy change. And that's exactly been the case in Iran. There's been very little change in so-called behavior of the Iranian regime uh, since sanctions uh, were imposed uh, 40 years ago and then tightened uh, 10, 12 years ago. But uh, sanctions have hampered economic growth. Uh, when they tightened in 2011, they took away a big chunk of Iran's foreign exchange earnings, dealt a real big blow to the economy. Poverty has increased. Uh, 
even middle class has shrunk. Uh, and it's not clear that that pain has been transmitted from the population to, to the leadership. Barbara, what is your view uh, on sanctions against a country like Iran? I mean, is there an end goal to these sanctions? And if so, has the United States and its allies, or for that matter, the United Nations as well, ever achieved those goals? Well, I think sometimes they do work. We first have to understand that sanctions are an alternative to, to war, to real war. And in that sense, they are preferable. Uh, I believe sanctions can work when they uh, have wide support, strong multilateral support, and when they have clear and achievable goals. So an example would be the UN sanctions and the US sanctions that led to the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. I think the sanctions were instrumental in helping to get that agreement. Unfortunately, the Trump administration withdrew from this nuclear deal uh, with nothing to replace it. And the sanctions that were reimposed have been largely unilateral, extremely punitive, with no clear objective, because we never really knew what would be considered uh, a uh, preferable alternative to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. There were a bunch of impossible demands that were placed on Iran by the Trump administration. And so these sanctions have failed. And I agree with uh, Javad. They have enriched uh, the smugglers and people who are well positioned in the Iranian elite, and they have massively hurt ordinary people. So it depends. Yeah. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Barbara, you say economic sanctions are on an alternative to real war, but isn't the effect the same? People are dying. I think it, uh, it's different. Um, obviously, there are economic uh, consequences which can be very dire, but uh, it is much preferable to having U.S. bombers or Israeli bombers over Iranian cities. Uh, unfortunately, what has happened is that politically, uh, these types of tools are very popular in the U.S. Congress. And so sometimes we have Congress leading an administration. I think that's true often on Democratic administrations. And they have become way too prevalent. And they're losing their effect in terms of uh, influencing the policies of countries. Uh, and they're also leading to other effects, which I'm sure we'll talk about, de-dollarization, various ways of getting around them. So over time, they are losing their effectiveness, for sure. Ben Norton, what do you make of that difference that Barbara is pointing to, that economic sanctions are an alternative to real war? Well, I think it's a, it's a false distinction. In fact, it was U.S. President Woodrow Wilson who famously said, sanctions are, quote, something more tremendous than war. That was a quote that was cited in the study that your reporter mentioned that was published this May by the Washington, D.C.-based think tank, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, by the well-known economist Francisco Rodriguez. And his report shows that the imposition of U.S. sanctions on a country results in mortality rates increasing by 35 percent on average. His report also found that sanctions are four times deadlier than civil war for a country. So if you're looking simply at the death toll, in fact, you could argue that sanctions have been deadlier. And because you don't see the bombs being dropped, you don't see the dead bodies, people often think that they're less destructive. But in the case of Venezuela, a country that I have reported in and visited several times and seen the effect firsthand of sanctions, the, another report by the Center for Economic and Policy Research, this DC-based DC think tank by Jeffrey Sachs, found that the sanctions on Venezuela just in 2017 and 2018 led to 40,000 civilian deaths, tens of thousands of civilian deaths. And later, a top United Nations expert, a, a former special rapporteur, Alfred Desayas, who's a legal expert, also estimated 100,000 Venezuelan civilians died because of the effects of sanctions. And it's easy to explain why. It's because it prevents countries from importing medicines that are critically needed and uh, cancer treatments and such. We see the same effects in Syria, in Iran, in Zimbabwe. It also prevents the country from importing machine parts that are needed to repair public transportation and also medical equipment. I mean, there are so many effects that sanctions have on civilians that are not seen. And the United States often claims that it has humanitarian exceptions, but the reality is we can see constant reports from United Nations experts, like the top UN expert on sanctions, Alina Duhan,
who has com reported constantly that over compliance by companies around the world leads to essentially sanctions being blockades of countries and no one wants to do business with those countries right. and that means it's very hard to import life-saving medicine and medical equipment. Ivan Elan, the United States foreign policy analyst uh, Richard Haas, he said in 1998, that's 25 years ago, that sanctions do not achieve their goal. They penalize innocent people, they hurt the U.S. economy, and they are hard to lift once in place. Uh, firstly, do you agree with that? And if so, why are they still so widely used? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, I think he's right, basically. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do with them. The, hard, the more uh, ambitious goal, like, uh, you know, altering a regime or getting them to stop a war or something, they're not usually very effective on big things. Sometimes they can be effective on small things. But I think we, we have to turn our gaze inward. Why do countries do this when they're not that effective? And that, the reason is because they're effective in doing one thing, and that is they're a medium response when military force is too strong, or in the case of Russia, you don't want to direct direct warfare between the U.S. and and Russia because they could go nuclear, right? So you don't want. But there, it, 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 but the, if the if military is too strong and doing nothing is unacceptable because you want to um, demonstrate your moral outrage, sanctions is the medium range uh, choice. And so you slap sanctions on there. And sometimes, uh, in the case of apartheid in South Africa, the U.S. conveniently sanctioned things that uh, were imports that South Africa competed with us, but it did not um, sanction too many exports to South Africa. That's just one example. So oftentimes, countries will conveniently sanction stuff that helps interest groups within their country. So I think you have to look uh, domestically to see why countries keep doing this, especially the United States. Right, but Ivan, if you say that a military response in some of these instances is too strong, I mean, Ben Norton just gave us some very striking figures there on the impact of sanctions, and in many instances, they're worse than a military strike. Well, it depends on how strong you put them on. Sometimes they just put on symbolic sanctions. But in, I, I basically agree with this point, and that is, what, what's the difference if you kill people with bombs or if you starve them to death or because if you knock out, they can't get the parts for their, uh, you know, sewage treatment plant or something and people start dying of disease. So, yes, I think in certain cases, economic sanctions might be as bad. But I'm talking about domestically. If you're a domestic policymaker, you say war is too strong, doing nothing or just a diplomatic protest is too weak. Sanctions are a mid-range way to show your, your disgust. Mm. And, you know, whatever the fallout is, is not registered in the domestic country, mm. it's registered in some other country. So I think domestically, uh, it's a very good choice mm -hmm. for policymakers. It's not a good choice for the country, and it may not even be good foreign policy for the United States or any other country putting on the sanctions, but it, 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 it has a useful uh, uh, outcome for the policymakers. They've, they've done something. That's gov sometimes government is just pretending you're doing something, yeah. and I think that's the case with, uh, a lot of times with sanctions. Joe, I want to get back to something that Ben Norton mentioned, and this is specifically uh, humanitarian sanctions or medical sanctions in this case. The Intercept, which is an online uh, media site, uh, recently published a report saying children are dying in Iran because companies are too scared to sell medicine to the country. The companies say that U.S. foreign policy is ultimately causing the problems, according to this report. What can you tell us about this? Well, there's no doubt that uh, there has been excess mortality in Iran as a result of the sanctions. Uh, much of this occurred when Iran could not import uh, uh, good vaccines uh, in 2020, uh, when it was the epicenter of the uh, uh, coronavirus epidemic uh, outside China. Uh, but uh, I'm not, I haven't read the report by, uh, that you mentioned about child mortality rising, there's no question that uh, companies are unwilling to deal with Iran because uh, unless they do due diligence, which is to look everywhere for possible connection 
for exports or whatever they're exporting to a hospital that might be owned by the Revolutionary Guards yeah. or something like that, they really uh, uh, feel they are uh, opening uh, themselves to risks of retaliation by the U.S. So it's just as easy for them to say, no, we don't have that medicine, or we can't export right now, or we do it later. Right. So there is shortage of medicine in Iran, and there's no question about it. It's affecting people with uh, like cancer and also children. Uh, there but, is, you know, yeah, there is something else at play here, Javed, and that is, in many instances, these medicines that we're talking about are on uh, a list of exceptions. You know, the the sanctions. Uh, make provision for the supply of these medicines to a country like Iran, but these countries are saying, yes, we can supply these under the current sanctions regime, but uh, we cannot accept payment for them because that would uh, violate financial sanctions. So the impact is the same, isn't it? But they are allowed actually to move money around in order to finance uh, export of medicine to Iran. But as I said, it's this overcompliance uh, mm -hmm. that Barbara also mentioned that is the problem because right. there is not a very clear uh, delineation of, uh, you know, there's no court or anywhere where you go and people say, no, I did the right thing or I looked the right way. Uh, the U.S. will just simply snap uh, uh, sanctions or penalize the company if it finds out that uh, a transaction it has done is involved a, a sanctioned entity inside Iran. Barbara, let's look at the sanctions that have been imposed against uh, Russia. It's facing very heavy sanctions. In fact, I think it's the harshest sanctions ever imposed on a single country. But uh, the, U the UK government said the point of the sanctions was to, quote, devastate the Russian economy. But would it be fair to say that these sanctions have failed to achieve their purpose? And in some instances, they would appear to have backfired. Because if you look at, at what's happened, uh, energy prices have gone up for countries in Europe. Um, President Putin, of course, is still in the Kremlin. Russia, uh, Germany is going through a recession right now. Um, is, would it be fair to say that it's backfired? I'm not. I'm not certain of that. Frankly, I think they have had quite a devastating, uh, devastating impact uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, Russia has been able to substitute other products for Western products. And of course, Europeans have been able to find substitutes for, for Russian gas. Uh, Russia, in one way, is not as severely penalized as Iran. These are not secondary sanctions. Iran is under secondary sanctions. That means that the United States can go after other countries and companies in other countries that do business with Iran, not just American companies. For Russia, that is not the case. And Russia has been able to continue to sell oil. Uh, it's just switched and is selling most of it now to China and, and other countries in Asia. Uh, but we have seen a mass exodus of the Russian intelligentsia. Uh, certainly, living standards are not quite as good as they were before, and I would not say that Russia is pleased uh, with uh, the conduct of the war in Ukraine, which was supposed to be a special military operation that would be over in days, and now has dragged on and on for more than a year, uh, causing immense devastation, uh, of course, particularly to the people of Ukraine. So I think that's a different case. I wanted to add something about Iran sanctions, though, and that is it's not just the sanctions. The problem, one of the problems is that Iran has a very opaque economy with a lot of corruption and mismanagement. And even when sanctions were briefly lifted after the Iran nuclear deal was reached in 2015, there were a number of companies that were leery of getting involved in the Iranian market because of that lack of transparency and concern that companies might indeed have ownership uh, by the IRGC uh, or some other entity. And it wasn't you know, clear. Iran also never ratified uh, conventions against money laundering uh, and uh, various other uh, financial regulations that are usually required mm. for foreign companies, particularly big multinational companies, to invest in a country. So sanctions are not the only reason uh, that Iran is suffering uh, from all of these problems. Um, there are humanitarian exemptions. They are not effective enough. Mm -hmm. And the people who have suffered a great deal are those who need certain very specialized medicines for rare conditions. 
Uh, Iran makes about 95 percent of uh, the medications that are used domestically. But some of these medications for rare conditions have to be imported. And there we have seen certainly uh, big problems. Javad, a very quick response to you, uh, from you uh, to what Barbara just told us. Well, you know, actually, if you look at the, uh, Iran's uh, economic performance, yeah. uh, it's the same government, very similar institutions before 2011, when sanctions tightened, the economy was growing. According to some sources, international data, 9% per year. All of a sudden, after 2011, uh, growth stops. In some cases, the GDP begins to decline. There is no doubt in my mind that the critical factor in reversing that trend of yeah. economic growth into stagnation and decline were sanctions. I know there is a lot of corruption in Iran. There is yeah. mismanagement. Uh, which developing country doesn't have that? Yeah. But if you want to pinpoint uh, whether it was sanctions or whether it was domestic mismanagement that has caused the pain, uh, all you have to do is look at the GDP data that's published, uh, and is, uh, I've reproduced that in the book, and you see uh, the graph going up and then going down. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is it isn't just that sanctions hurt people. Yeah. They actually are bad policy because one way to get Iran to become a better player in the global or right. in the regional uh, uh, scale is to allow its private sector to grow. And uh, people maybe don't recognize Iran is not just a government and an IRGC. There's a large private sector. Yeah. You know, three out of four workers work for the private sector. Okay. When you hurt these people, you are hurting the uh, only source of moderation in the long run. Right. What we found out in that book okay. is that Iranian government became more authoritarian as a result of sanctions. Okay. So it really backfired in many ways. Ben Norton, uh, you know, Barbara uh, was telling us a moment ago uh, about the difference between the sanctions that were imposed on Iran and those sanctions that have been imposed on Russia. Uh, the fact that there are no second, these are not secondary sanctions against Russia. And doesn't that tell us, isn't it indicative of the fact that the United States has been unable to force its will on countries who continue to trade with Russia? I mean, some of the biggest countries in the world, India continues to trade with Russia. So does China. So does the countries of Latin America. So do the countries of Africa. Absolutely, that's right. I mean, we've seen this has actually ironically fueled the process of de-dollarization. Russia is now doing trade in its own currency with India, with Iran, with Bangladesh, and many other countries in the region are considering similar processes. The Southeast Asian nations and ASEAN have signed an agreement to do local trade in currencies as well. And I think at the same time, I, we should also reframe the question about whether or not sanctions are effective. because. Clearly, sanctions have not been effective in leading to a change in government, to regime change, which is Washington's number one goal. But they have been effective in the sense that they have crippled many of the economies in the countries where they're being targeted. I mean, and that's really the intentional goal. We've seen this quite clearly in the past year from the rhetoric of the, yeah. the U.S. government. Joe Biden said that the sanctions goal were to make the Russian ruble into rubble. Of course, the ruble is used as a currency by more than 100 million civilians in Russia, and the goal was to destroy their currency. Uh, the U.S., for instance, has more recently taken very aggressive posturing against China. Uh, Gina Raimondo, the Commerce Secretary, said the U.S. goal is to prevent innovation in China, and the U.S. hit Chinese tech companies with sanctions to prevent them from competing with U.S. companies. And we've also seen that President Biden said in 2021 that his goal is to prevent China from being the most powerful and richest country on earth. So, right. I mean, yes, the political uh, reasoning behind sanctions have failed, but at the same time, they have had their intended impact of crippling the economies that they've targeted, and at the same time, ironically, fueling the drive toward de-dollarization and countries seeking alternatives to the US-dominated financial system uh -huh. and the interbank messaging system like the SWIFT system. We now right. see alternatives emerging all across Asia. Right. Ivan, uh, much of the U.S. power to implement sanctions and to force other countries to comply with those sanctions is because of the dominance of the United States dollar as the reserve currency. But now countries are looking at alternatives. And ultimately, once that effort gains momentum, will that uh, significantly weaken the U.S. sanctions regime? 
Yeah, well, I think so. And I think that would be a very bad effect of all the sanctions uh, because the, we get a lot of benefits from the dollar being the reserve currency. But, you know, uh, it, it could lead to that. And it's uh, it's unfortunate because I think a lot of these sanctions they hit. Well, what are they really sanctions? They, they're economic tools, but they have a political effect. Sure, you can grind the uh, make it a grinding uh, thing against Russia or Iran or whatever to drag their economy, but it doesn't really do what you want it to do. In the case of Russia, does it get Putin out of Ukraine or does it overthrow Putin? No, it's not going to do that. And uh, some weapon sanctions, if you can get anything with a cartel like weapons, but dual use and that sort of thing, you should re uh, not do sanctions because the world needs to advance in technology. You need to stay open societies, flourish. Uh, and so you got to stay ahead of them by that. I mean, you don't try to sanction to stay ahead of in semiconductor of this or whatever. It, it just doesn't work. And, uh, you know, it's better to have a free and open society and just outrun them if they get whatever country is competing with you, just try to beat them in the marketplace. Uh, and I think that's what the, the United States should do. I think all these sanctions are ridiculous and they're counterproductive. And one of the things, the one of the big things, big negative effects is, you know, de-dollarization. Barbara, uh, I've just got about a minute left, but is it true that, you know, countries will always act in their own interests? I mean, if we look at the sanctions imposed against Russia, we know that European countries, uh, which are part of those sanctions against Russia, continue to trade in oil with Russia. Only now they're doing it through third countries and paying a lot more. Actually, I think they've reduced quite substantially, and they've put caps on the price of Russian oil, so it, Russia is getting less money for it. Let me just say a word on de-dollarization. It's a word that's very much in vogue, but it's not really happening. Uh, because there is no other currency which has, is as liquid as the U.S. dollar. Right. Uh, certainly not the U.N., not the ruble, not the rupee. Uh, most countries still tend to use the dollar for transactions and also for savings, for bonds, and so on. And so, you know, we're being warned about it. Certainly it's a possibility, but I don't think it's happening quite yet. Okay, and that is where we're going to have to leave it. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C.